You're tuned in to the New Life Fellowship audio service. Here at New Life, we believe in facilitating a worship service that reflects the abundant new life that Jesus wants to give us in John 10.10. As you listen to today's sermon, feel free to share points that stand out to you on social media and use the hashtag NewLifeAU to join the national conversation. Enjoy today's message. Father in heaven, we are asking today that your presence may tarry a little longer with us today. And if you stay just a little longer, we'll promise to give you all the honor and all the praise. And so, Father, we ask that your presence might descend down in a mighty way, as it has already. But we're praying for an overdosing of your abundance grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today is the beginning of our family series, Family Matters. It is a part of our year-long relate theme that family should be a part of this relating dynamics. And so today I want to share parts of my story with you. And so growing up, there were some distinctive phrases I would hear that if I were to hear them again, every time I go home, they would make me laugh. And so one thing that my mother would do, she would say, if her ear was itching, she would say, somebody talking about her. Right? She said, my ear itching, somebody talking about me. Another thing that my mother would do is that if her hand was itching, she would say, I'm about to get some money. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh, my hand itching. I'm about, to, I'm about to get some money. Another thing that would, 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 uh, a phrase that I grew up on was, don't step on the crack, you're going to break your mama back. So I would care walking on the sidewalk trying not to step on the, the crack. Another thing that we would say up on the East Coast would be, don't split the pole. Come on now. <laughs> don't split the pole. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know, if, if two are walking together and you're trying to go somewhere and there's a, a pole in the middle, you don't split it. It's, it's bad luck. Something bad's going to happen. You don't split it. You stay true to the path. You don't split the pole. Another phrase that I grew up on was, especially in my family, was this phrase called, blood is thicker than water. And I'm quite sure many of you have heard this phrase. It is a way that a family retains its loyalty to one another. It is a constant phrase that's used that says, hey, family is more important than your friends, they're more important than your teachers. Or I remember these phrases when I remember one time um, I, I took my friend's side over my sister's side and it made my mother very upset. And she pulled me aside, she said, boy, blood thicker than water. So even though my sister was wrong, you don't take nobody else's side. You stay true to the family. Stay true to the family, no matter what's going down. It was even if you and your cousins and sisters were beefing hard, if someone came at a relative, you say, hold up, you don't talk about them like that. Because blood was thicker than water. But if you've lived in a dysfunctional family as I have, you find it very hard to remain loyal to some crazy folk you find it very hard to remain loyal to the people that do you dirty and that have hurt you and that have damaged you and that have broken you. And so it was a phrase that I struggled with because I didn't really feel like being loyal to some jacked up folk, especially to the people that I knew was trying to be shady towards me, that was trying to hurt me or break me or did some very hard things that even now that I struggle with. And I brought this idea into the gospel. And it wasn't until I entered and found my way with Jesus Christ where a new revelation came to me. It was that although blood is thicker than water, the gospel is thicker than blood. And I want to preach that thing today. And it was this idea that what Christ had done for me 
is far more important and valuable than my loyalty to my family. And even the Bible talks about it. The Bible in Matthew talks about that if you are not willing to forsake your family and your friends and your mother and your father, then it's almost impossible to be a follower of mine. It was God's idea to redirect ultimate loyalty from me. It was this idea that I am in this thing to restore the dysfunctional ideas that you've brought. And I said to myself, how can I possibly be restored from the things that have hurt me the most? If blood is the ultimate form of loyalty, what savior do I have? Am I forever subject to the hurts and pains that my family have brought me And it wasn't until I experienced the gospel where my loyalty, true loyalties, began to shift because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And that journey has been a long one. And so let's begin with the first dysfunctional family. The first dysfunctional family was Adam and Eve. I mean, these folks started off real good. They started off good. Everything was going great. Then they have two sons named Cain and Abel. Now, these brothers just didn't have a regular rivalry. Cain killed Abel. I mean, one brother killed his brother. I mean, he ran up a home, knocked him on the head, watched him bleed out, and lied about it. This was his brother, not his cousin, not a friend. Not a co-worker, but his brother. Now, I want to put this in perspective. Adam White writes that when Adam saw the first leaf fall, he mourned greater than death. You know, when you go to these funerals and everybody falling out all over the casket and throwing dirt, wanting to lift it up and saying all this stuff. He was mourning like that when he saw a leaf fall. Today, we call that beautiful. We call it foliage. (laughs) Oh, man, the foliage is beautiful. This man, Adam, was mourning on the floor, crying before God because he saw a leaf fall. A few years later, he gets the news that his brother, his son, killed his other son. I only can imagine what mourning he experienced from that. If he mourned over a leaf, how much more did he mourn over the death of his son? And in fact, he lost both of his sons. One died, the other one had to run for his life. From that day forward, every person born on planet Earth has been born to a dysfunctional family. Every single one of us had been born to a dysfunctional family. I remember one time, one of my very few memories of my dad, he took me over his a house where one of my uncles and friends used to play spades. Anybody know how to play spades? That is the most violent game I've ever seen. Spades. Uh, playing spades, I was uh, about five, and I was playing with my other cousins, and they were drinking, having a good time. I don't know what happened, but they started to scuffle. <laughs> you know, just, just, just scuffle, you know what I mean? You know, over the game. And what, what I do know is that my dad did not win that battle. So he gets up, he looks at me and says, we gonna be all right. I said, I'm good, I'm good. And so I grew up in a violent environment where I now hate violence. Like, I do not like to impose violence. I do not like being aggressive unnecessarily unless provoked. Unless provoked. (laughs) I do not like it. I do not like it. I love, I love peace. I want peace. But if your story is like my story, you grew up 
in a very dysfunctional environment. And you probably don't, didn't recognize the degree of dysfunction until you probably started your freshman year at Andrews and you look back and you say, these folks are crazy. You didn't realize that you was in too deep. You didn't recognize how much hurt you was in. You didn't recognize mom and dad was really beefing until you go back for Christmas break and they're not in the same room no more. You didn't know that turmoil was all around you. Or if you were aware, then you probably hid in the room hoping that you couldn't hear the arguments coming from, from downstairs. Or some of you would argue that, man, I wish my parents could just work it out. I would just love for them to be together. And others might just say, people, just please, just break it off. And just, just go your separate ways so that we can be in peace. But nonetheless, we are all born into these dysfunctional families that we are raised in that play, plays a role into the way we view and experience life. You are sitting next to someone this morning who is hurt by the past experiences and the family that they were part of. They are hurt and broken because of unresolved issues at home. You are probably sitting next to someone who's really not that excited about going home in December, who would much rather make an agreement with the dean to see if we can stay during Christmas break. Some much rather pull a room together with friends and stay until the semester started. For me, the moment that I left, I did not come back. I did not come back. It was not a place that I wanted to go back to. And so each of us are born into dysfunctional families. In fact, when you meet someone, you ought to say, my name is Sam and I come from a dysfunctional family. But we don't do that. We smile and we say, hey, everything's perfect. And we cover these things up. The, the, the strength that the enemy has is that your pains and hurts and struggles are kept secret. That's where he builds his strength. That's where he builds his courage. In fact, that's the avenue in which he uses to control our lives because we simply won't talk about it, especially in the black community. We don't talk about it. In fact, mama will tell you, don't you talk about nothing that's going on in this house? What stays in this, what happens in this house? Stays in his house. So we don't talk about the challenges that we experience because communicating these pains are taboo. In fact, we often don't want to let folk know how jacked up we really are because on Sabbath morning, we look good and that's okay for us. And those are the experiences that we have. But I want to share a story with you, Genesis chapter 34. Genesis chapter 4 tells a story of a woman named Dina. I want to read the passage to you. A woman named Dina. Easy to read version. That's the version I like to preach from. It says, one day Dina, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, went to visit some friends of the Canaanite women. And so they were living in the area of Canaanite, and Dina went to go visit some of the friends she had made just by living in the area. When Shechem, the son of Hamar, the Hivite, who was chief of the region, saw her, he took her and raped her. So this was the prince of the area, saw Dina, took her and raped her. But he found the woman attractive and he fell in love with her and he was attracted to her. So he told his father, who was the ruler, I want her to be my wife. When Jacob learned that his daughter has been disgraced, but because his sons were out in the field with the livestock, he did nothing until they came back. So let's paint this picture. She just went to town to visit some friends, probably went to get her nails done, probably get her hair crimped, tried to get a sew in, <laughs> try to get it done. Or if you're natural, she wanted to get it blowed out, get it washed. Or for the brothers, wanted to get a lineup, look fresh. But on her way, she found herself 
being raped by a man who thought that every woman was his. Just took her to the woods and raped her. He enjoyed the rape so much that he said, I want to marry her. That's how much he enjoyed the rape. He wanted to do it again. This was somebody's daughter. So when Jacob the father found out what had happened, he said, I'm going to wait till my sons come back. I'm about to preach. Come on now. Stay with me. I want to talk to someone. Leah had 12 brothers. Come on now. Who worked in the field. Come on now. They weren't no accountants. They weren't lawyers. These brothers worked in. She, he said, I'm going to wait. I'm not going to do nothing until my sons come back. He says, I'm not going to make a move until my 12 sons and his followers and his workers and all those 12 tribes came together. I'm not going to make a move on what has happened to my daughter until my sons come back. Oh, I wish I had a witness. I wish I, 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 I can imagine that every single time that we are hurt, we are disappointed, Jesus is telling his father, I'm just going to wait till I come. I just, just wait till these folks see me coming through these clouds of glory and they're going to see what's going to happen. Keep on messing with my children and see what happens. Touch them one more time and see what, I wish I had a witness. So Japheth said, I'm not going to move until my 12 sons come. So the story goes like this. So the sons, they come in. They are furious. They're tight. Who did this to my sister? Blood is thicker than water. Now, they were in a diplomatic situation. They were foreigners in someone else's land. So a part of them wants to say, hey, let's not rustle no feathers. If they, you know, we're, we're small in numbers. They're going to come after us. Let's be diplomatic. The brothers are like, nah. <laughs> Nah. Nah. Brothers was like, nah. He did that to my who? Nah. <laughs> so they're now coming together. So the, the ruler at the time, Shechem, comes and he says, my son wants to marry your daughter. When Jacob was about to speak, the sons comes in. They say, all right, let's make a deal. So there, he really wants this woman. He says, we will give you whatever you want, whatever you want. So the brothers say, well, it is our custom that all men be circumcised to be a part of our family. Right? right? All men be circumcised to be a part. You know, they're, they're being loving at this moment. Man, we really want you to be a part of this family and we just really want this thing to work out. And man, if you would just do us this solid and just, just circumcise every man in your village, I think we could work something out. The guy says, bet. <laughs> We're going back to my village and we're gonna circumcise all the men. And so they do so. The Bible goes on and says that two, two, of the brothers go in three days later after everybody's suffering from circumcision. Just suffering, just no anesthesia, no aspirin, no ibuprofen. Just laid out before the Lord, just, just hoping that the pain will pass. Just this whole time, they're just and the two brothers, remembering what they had done to their sister, came in and killed every man in the village, including the rapist and the father who tried to sign off on. Two brothers, not 12. We're talking about the capacity of two angry brothers and what they would do when someone hurts a member of their family. And that's because blood is thicker 
than water. It was thicker than the agreement that they had made. It was thicker than the risk that they were taking. They were in a position to seek vengeance and to restore the integrity of a family member that was hurt. I wish I had a family member that would go slaughter some folk for me. I just, I just wish and not be slaughtered. I don't want to be slaughtered. I just wish I had some, some family members that would fight for me in and, and, and that capacity. But the, the Bible goes on and tells us that we're all part of this broken family. And for the rest of their existence, Dina was broken. That was it. She was raped. She couldn't be given for marriage. A brother had to take her in because she was now defiled. She was forever hurt and scarred by that experience. And their family was never the same. And that's what happens when hurt takes place in the home. Every single person is hurt because of it. You see, my, my father went to jail. I haven't seen, uh, my father went to jail for 10 years because he was a pedophile. Until this day, nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to say nothing. In fact, every time I enter into a room, it is a reminder that I'm his son. It is a pain that he had done, but it affected the entire family forever. I was never able to visit my father's side of the family ever again. Ever again. Not a visit, not a Thanksgiving, not an email, not a phone call. I remember when I was 19 years old, when I graduated from college, they opened up a closet and it was all my Christmas gifts. They were never able to give them to me. It was because the pain ran so deep that it had devastated the family. And many of us and many of you are going home this break to devastated families, to hurt families, to broken families. But my encouragement is, is that the gospel is greater than blood. It's greater than the pains that we experience. It is a restoring factor that can make all things new. In fact, Revelation tells us, lo, I will make all things new. And the request is, Lord, you've got to make this family new because we can't go into heaven with all this dysfunction. You have to make what we understand as family dynamics new. You know, there are some folk that can't connect with God because he's perceived as a male-figured father, and folk have daddy issues, and so you just can't connect with God in that way. That all happened because, folks, stuff happened in the family. These dynamics affect even our capacity to connect with God. Our image of him is completely distorted because our families are distorted. You know, the challenging part about the whole family dynamics is that it just doesn't end. It continues into the church. There's a reason why we call each other's brother and sister. It is because the family example is continued even into the church. And so we look at the church and we hope that there will be salvation from it. But then you realize that these folk just as crazy as my folk. Or that your church is composed of your crazy folk. Come on now. Knowing that your daddy crazy and he's still the first elder. Still the deacon. And you sitting here wondering why they keep electing this man. Only if they knew what this man was doing at home. They would know that he would not be fit for office. Knowing. The challenges of home. And so this is what happens. This is what happens when you have family challenges. Is that you carry these burdens everywhere you go. And you carry them on your back. You go to class with them. 
We sing with them. We preach with them. We meet friends with tons of burdens on our backs. And so like me, I've carried burdens for many years. The Bible tells us that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the what? The word of his testimonies. Some scholars believe that the book of Job is actually the first piece of literature written that will be contributed to the Bible. Did you catch that? Job, not Genesis. While Genesis might have the oldest content, but the first piece of literature written was the book of Job. The authors at that time were living in a prehistoric time where storytelling was the best way to explain people, things, and time. And so what would happen is, what would happen is, is that kids and children and visitors would say, tell us about Yahweh. They would say, tell us about your God. They didn't begin with Genesis. They began like this. There was a man named Job. Now, Western philosophy have us reading the piece of literature, identifying that Job is the main character of the story. Right? The original authors, Job was not the main character of the story. God was the main character of Job's story. The author used Job to explain God. I want you to get that. When someone would say, tell me about who God is, they would say, let me tell you about a man named Job. It is through the telling of Job's story that God's character and who he is was revealed. So what happens is your story and my story is really not our story. I'm going to preach. Stay with me. God uses our story to help the world better understand who he is. Every trial, every challenge, every heartbreak is an opportunity for the world to understand the character of Jesus. And so the Bible says it is through that process that we are overcome and we can overcome by the word of God's testimony through us. Right? So it is my hope today that my story will help you overcome it is hope my story will help you overcome some of the challenges that you might be having. And so today I brought my burdens with me. And I want to unload them with you. For the Bible tells us that we share and carry each other's burdens. And so I want to unload my burdens with you. And the first one is... Addiction. Now, I've never personally been addicted to anything. I despise addiction. I carry that brick. It's because I was raised in a crack cocaine addicted household. For all of my life, my mother was addicted to crack cocaine. With that came a plethora of challenges, TVs going missing, and sneakers going missing, and lunch money going missing. In fact, she would go missing for months at a time. What would happen is, through this addiction comes drug dealers, people knocking on the door looking for your mom. I mean, there were times when we could not comprehend what was happening. I mean, power was going off, rent wasn't being paid, and it was just me and my sister. Hopefully another brother or sister older was there, but by that time, they want to get out too. And so there was much of my life being raised surrounded by drugs. I knew what it looked like. I knew what it smelled like. My mother told me one time when she was going through rehab, she says the first moment her lips touched that pipe, she knew she was in trouble. And so for the rest of my life, all the way up until I left for college, 
It was my hope that I would never return to an environment. I never was attracted to a cigarette. I never wanted, do anybody know what a Lucy is? Anybody know what a Lucy is? If you're from Brooklyn, you probably know what a Lucy is. It's when the, the bodega used to sell cigarettes loosely if you couldn't afford the whole pack. So you would say, let me get a, a Lucy. I would have to go get Lucy's. And so that was a challenge for our entire family, being raised and uh, child protective services, going in and out of homes and being raised with my grandmother in and out of circumstances. And there were some major issues. And I really haven't fully grasped the hold of my experiences until I remember something and then I would have to ask, what was happening at that time in life where this was happening? And so that was my story, and I carry that brick because it comes with fears, it comes with anxiety, it comes with disappointments. And so uh, that's one of the bricks that I carry, and that's one of the burdens that I carry, that's one of the challenges that I carry. Another brick is, I remember a particular time, it was called eviction. I pray that none of you have ever had to experience being evicted. If you don't know what that is, it's when you're involuntarily removed from your house. When you haven't paid your bills. And so what happens is you get off the school bus with all your friends, right? All your friends, all your pals. Well, I'm done, man. See your leg, go do some old work. Yeah, yo, bro, is that your couch, bro? All of your things on the side of the road, all your TVs, your couch, your PlayStation, everything you can possibly possess, and you've got about 30 seconds to figure out where you're going to sleep that night. So where do we go? Back to grandma's house. And so when I got married, it was one of the burdens of mine that I would never experience that in my life. Rent will always be paid ahead of time. No lateness all the time. And so that was a challenge and a burden that I experienced. And so I was raised in a single parent community home because my dad went to prison, didn't have many strong male figures. There were people who invested into me. One thing that I will say, you are truly looking at the evidence of a corporate effort. There are people, when I'm, I'm referring to me, I'm referring to me, you're looking at a corporate effort. There are, a deacon taught me how to tie my tie. A deacon at the church, say, hey man, come on brother, let me show you how to tie this tie correctly. Pulled me aside, showed me how to tie the tie. It will be my pleasure to one day teach my son how to tie his tie. how to wear my shoes appropriately, how to dress appropriately. It was a deacon at the church who did these things. In fact, one of the most significant people in my life that played a role in my life was an elementary school teacher named Mrs. DeRocher. She's been to my wedding, she's been to my graduation, she's been to my baby dedications. Every time we go to Connecticut, we visit her, we eat lunch, this is not a woman of God, per se, but a woman that had invested in me and cared for me. When I needed a few bucks to get through college, called Miss DeRocher, and she would be there. These are the bricks that I've carried. And for years, you could not see them. I, I don't carry them anymore, thank God, because you've decided to carry them with me is that we would preach with these, get married with these burdens. And what would happen is we would build walls with these bricks, right? Right, we build walls with them. And so it's through the building of these bricks that each and every single one of us carry is that that's how we keep people out. Not healthy bricks, but broken and hurtful bricks. In fact, these are the bricks that we build marriages on. Come on now, right? 
right? We, we, we haven't unloaded them. So we start building stuff on abuse and we start building stuff on rape and uh, uh, neglect and poverty. And we carry these as foundations into our marriage. And then seven years from now, we're like, man, the marriage just went left and I don't know why. We just can't seem to get it together because both of you done came with your bricks and never had an opportunity to unload them. The best part about the gospel and why I truly believe that the gospel is thicker than blood, it is because Christ is willing to carry these bricks for me. Come on now. All the pains and hurts that you've experienced in your family, all the trials and tribulations, all those things, all the daddy issues, all the mama issues, all the auntie issues, all those things is God wanting to relieve you from them. But this is what happens. We carry them so long, we don't realize we have them. They're light work now. They're light we walking, we playing ball with them. We, we going to dance class with them. We, having to, we carrying all these bricks, heavy bricks, carrying them for so long that we don't even realize how heavy they are until Christ is like, let me carry them for you. Let me hold them for you. Let me relieve you of that. And then when he takes them off, you realize how light and how free you are. And how now you're now in a position to take healthy bricks and build a healthy life and build a healthy future. And if those opportunities are not taken now, you're going to hook up with a young lady across the hall right now from you. And both of you is going to be building unhealthy houses together, unhealthy bricks together, because mommy and daddy issues have not been resolved and home issues have not been resolved. But the solution is... The gospel is simple. It is this thing that Christ is saying. He's saying, if you follow me, you then become a part of my family. That's it. That's it. If you ever wanted a new family, give your life to Jesus. What Christ is saying, if you become a follower of mine, I will open up doors where you can now begin to heal from your past experiences and you can then begin to develop healthy family relationships. Healthy family relationships. Now you can give birth to healthy families, children, and you can go on, but that takes place if you become a part of God's family. And you become a follower of Jesus Christ. If you allow Jesus to become your brother, if you allow Jesus, every time you're hurt and you're pain, you say, I'm going to wait till Jesus come to solve all your problems. If you allow that the family dynamics, don't you know how many angels got Jesus got on his side? How many are there to assist and help you? In fact, Jesus is so helpful. He says, I'm leaving, but I'm leaving a helper, the spirit of the Holy Ghost, to be here to assist you and to help you and to guide you and to shield you from all the trials and tribulations that you might be experiencing. What God is suggesting is that you leave your family and you become a part of his. Now, I'm not saying take your family, kick them to the side. I'm not not saying that. What God is asking is for one's loyalty. But the problem is we often don't run to Christ until these bricks get too heavy. Get too heavy. And we finally come to him and say, Lord, I can't carry them anymore. So this is what I want to do today. This is what I want to do today. I want to hear your story. I literally, personally, want to hear your story. I believe your story will help me overcome. So today, I'll be standing at the back of that door, and I want to hear your story. Because the longer your story is secret, is the more power the devil has. So I'm leaving myself. I want to carry one of your bricks. I want to hold one of your bricks. I want to hold 500 bricks. 
because I believe that your story will help me. And it is my hope that my story has helped you. Yes. Let's say you don't want to tell me your story today. Let's say you don't want to tell me. Chap email is on the screen. Write them. Maybe you write better than you talk. Tell your story. Write us. Let us know your trials, your challenges, what has hurt you. And let us know how God has been working in your life. And so today, I do not want anyone to leave with more bricks than they came in. And what's going to happen, you're going to look at me and you're going to act like you want to talk. and You're going to be like, ah, he don't want to hear my story. No. I want to hear your story. Your story is important to us. And we believe, I believe, that by sharing your story, I promise you, if you're a counselor, you will know the answers that once you share, you feel just the burdens lifted. You will feel it. You'll be like, oh, thank God. I, I just wanted to tell somebody. I didn't know who to tell. Your story is confidential with me. Your story will be prayed for. I would love to hear your story. Maybe the, the line is long and you really got to go. Chap is here. Tanya is here. Janelle is here. We here want to hear your story. We want to relieve you of one of those heavy bricks that you're carrying today. And so I want you to close your eyes. I want you to close your eyes. The mere fact that I asked you to share your story, some of you are already filled with anxiety because the story is so painful and the story has so much hurt associated or so much embarrassment associated with it. And so I want you to think about that story. Think about what brick you want to unload today. Think about what story you want to unload. What story that you want to come and leave at the altar of God. Because every brick unloaded is an opportunity for you to be free. And it's only through the freedom that you are free to worship and share with God. And so today, I want you to pray with me. My prayer is prophetic for you. It is prophetic for you. It is that I believe God wants to restore you. I believe that God wants to heal you. I believe God wants to take you and comfort you. I believe that God sees a future for you that you don't see for yourself. I believe that God has an abundant blessing that is outside of the pains of a divorced home or a broken home or a separated home. You are more than defeated. You are a conqueror. And so what he's saying is, give me one of those bricks. Let me carry one of them for you. And I promise you, it'll be okay. We'll work it out together. We'll go through the cobwebs together. And so our prayer is lifted up and saying, Lord, we don't want to carry this thing any longer. It's heavy. It's burdensome. It's scary. And so we ask that you take it from us. Comfort us through this process. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the New Life Fellowship audio service. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you and that you will continue to tune in. New Life is located in the Seminary Chapel on the campus of Andrews University, and our services are held every Saturday at 1145 a.m. Keep up with the latest information about what's happening at New Life by subscribing to our podcast on iTunes and through our social media connections on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Simply type in New Life AU in the search bar and you'll find us. Until next time, may the Lord bless you with a new love, new integrity, new faith, and a new experience.